Euh... Allô Oui. Oui. Où je commence Non, 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 tu attends, là, les, les participants arrivent. Ok. Et je pense que Stéphanie fera une petite introduction aussi ouais. euh, avant que tu parles. Ouais. Enfin, Peut-être d'abord Nicolas et après Stéphanie. Ouais. Uh, so pe people are arriving on the, the Zoom. I'm going to wait a few seconds. Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to today's uh, same seminar. Uh, unfortunately, uh, due to a strike uh, in uh, Occitanie train, we can't have uh, Gwenaël in Montpellier today. So the seminar will be 100% uh, online. Uh, as every week, you can ask your questions on the Q&A. If there is a problem, you can also uh, contact us on the chat, but uh, it will be much simpler today, I assume. And now I leave uh, Stephanie introduce uh, today's speaker. Uh, hello. Uh, so it's my pleasure to have uh, Gwenel uh, Pigano giving us a seminar today. So Gwenel is working uh, in Banyuls at the Marine Biodiversity and Biotechnology uh, Unit. And uh, she's working on a range of topics around uh, phytoplankton um, evolution and ecology. And um, Gwenel, um, please let us know your last fascinating stories. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm uh, sorry not to be uh, in person there today. So I'm going to talk to you about what we have been doing uh, in uh, my group in Banyul sur mer You can see uh, in the in the background of this first slide that is uh, two hours and a half away from Montpellier in train when the train uh, do uh, work. So um, in my group, we are, we are working on uh, phytoplanktonic organism. And uh, on this uh, slide, you can see the chlorophyll emission on, uh, from our planet. And this is just to illustrate the ecological importance of this marine phytoplankton organism that are responsible for roughly half of the photosynthesis on our planet. And I use this illustration to just locate the banyul sur mer on this map. So photos photosynthesis is a very important metabolism on our planet, and it has been adopted by many lineages. So it has been invented by uh, bacteria a uh, long time ago, and uh, then maybe approximately one or two billion years ago, a eukaryote adopted uh, an ancestral cyanobacteria, and this gave rise to the green lineage. So in my group, we are working on uh, many members of these green lineages of the class Mamilophysi. Uh, but uh, other eukaryotic lineages have, uh, adapt have engulfed some photosynthetic bacteria or eukaryotes. And so in a bucket of seawater, you do actually have photosynthetic organisms from all over the tree of life. So you can see each colored branch here corresponds to a photosynthetic organism. So um, we're interested in um, uh, small photosynthetic eukaryotes. Uh, they have a, a simple cellular organization. Uh, by that, I mean they have one single chloroplast, one single mitochondria. Uh, the white dot here, actually, I hope you can see my uh, my mouse. The, the, the white dot is a starch granule. Uh, they are ecologically important, especially in coastal area, where they can represent up to 80% of the biomass. Uh, the strains we have isolated uh, are, are haploids, like most uh, green eukaryotic microalgae. 
uh, what is a uh, kind of uh, a very good news for for all the genomics and bioinformatic analysis uh, pipelines we use. Uh, they are relatively easy to grow in the lab. They are usually divided once per day if you give them 12 hours of light and uh, 12 hours of night. And so they are very interesting models uh, for plant systems biology. So over the last uh, 20 years, we have uh, optimized a little bit our sampling protocol. Uh, so uh, from eight to five weeks from sample uh, from environmental sampling to identification of a strain. So basically the most rapid method uses single cell sorting with a cytometer we have in banyul sur mer directly on the freshly filtered seawater. Uh, and once we've got uh, the, the culture grown from one single cell, we do actually sequence the 18S to, to get its taxonomic affiliation and then we can know which species we have. So it's difficult to target a special species because actually they do live, uh, they're very diverse all over the place. Uh, within chlorophytes, you usually get uh, either Australococcus, Baticocus, or Micromonas from the same sample. And for all of these uh, strains, we do have a, a completely sequenced genome. The natural environment of uh, our microalgae is infested by viruses. And uh, Nigel Grimsley, who's an emeritus CNRS researcher uh, in my group, isolated the first uh, Osteococcus uh, virus, uh, 2006. So these are double-stranded DNA viruses um, that are very diverse in the environment as well. And um, it turns out that double-stranded DNA virus um, are very abundant in, in the sunlit up. Um, in the sunlit uh, ocean, and they tend to infect uh, many other photosynthetic eukaryotes uh, from other lineages. So this double-stranded DNA virus phytoplankton uh, uh, system, it's phylogenetically very diverse uh, in the ocean. Um, if you look at the, the, the phylogenomics of these these viruses, they are part of the giant uh, virus family that uh, that has this very, very big genomes of two megabase. So you can see them here. So they, they are not that big. They're infecting the smallest photosynthetic eukaryotes. They're 200 kilobase big. So basically, the, the genome resources we are uh, uh, working on, they are so for the hosts, they are haploid, small, compact genomes on 17 to 21 chromosomes, approximately uh, 15 megabase. And for the viruses, it's a linear sequence of uh, 200 kilobase. So today I'm going to uh, uh, present you some, some results we obtained in the past about the, the genomic signatures of the, the cell immunity of uh, uh, our microalgae, or more exactly picoalgae, because they are so small to viruses in natural population. And then I will, most of my talk will about the, the will be about the results we are we are we are having now about the um, the understanding of the the change in phenotype between susceptible and resistant strains. So the first part will be strictly about population genomics. While the second part will be about experimental evolution and combining different levels of information we want to, to have on our system, on the transcriptomes, the genomes, the metabolome, and the, and the translatome. So um, how do we uh, phenotype actually our strains in our system? Uh, basically, we expose a microalgae culture to some environmental water or some virus we have previously isolated from environmental water. And then we just observe what's going on. We'll say that a strain is susceptible when it, when it slides and the number of virus particles increases. Resistance is uh, defined by the fact that the microalgae doesn't care about the virus. And we also have some uh, uh, cultures where basically both the microalgae strain and the um, the virus do increase in, in quantity. So um, when we say that we have a resistance strain, we actually mean, uh, we may mean three different things depending on how we observed resistance. 
So if we uh, uh, looked at cytometry data, uh, we get a very precise estimation of the resistance. We have observed the we have we have observed that the, the, the number of various particles doesn't change. And we can actually detect whether we have a resistant, a resistant, a resistant producer or susceptible phenotype. Historically, we didn't do that. Historically, we, we just performed the visual color tests uh, that we repeated, of course, and we also looked at microscopy to, to see that we, we had actually lysis. And when we do that, basically, we, we've got a rough idea whether it's resistant or susceptible or, or highly susceptible to the virus. And the third thing that also needs to be done is a plague assay. Basically, you put the microalgae in semi-liquid um, agar and you uh, and, and the virus, and then you can actually count the number of plague forms and then you get the number of infective viruses. So this is also a very important technique. So basically, we, we use the three techniques, but we use the same word, and, and this uh, can create confusions. So this is a, an illustration of uh, when you want to check the resistance spectrum of one strain you put into the agar on different viruses. This is what you do. You do it in duplicate. If there are two lysis, you say, oh, this strain is susceptible to that virus. And where there's no lysis, you say, oh, this strain is resistant to that virus. So we have been collecting these viruses. So we have been doing a cross experiment. So this is a simple visual experiment. And with this experiment, we could define uh, super susceptible strains, like the first one, SCT4221, that is lysed by most viruses we have isolated. And strain A, just below, you can see that we can hardly find any virus that, that will lyse this strain. So you have a high variation of, of uh, cell immunity uh, within Osteococcus toei uh, natural population. Uh, we had the, the sequences of the host, and this is something that we're continuing to do, trying to isolate a, a, a big population of these uh, strains. And when we sequenced, uh, when we first sequenced these strains, so at the beginning we just had uh, 12, we noticed that uh, one chromosome that is uh, called the small outlier chromosome, because it has a different GC content and many transposable elements, so we had called it small outlier chromosome due on just these genomic features, that this small outlier chromosome had a very uh, variable coverage in the strain. So when you do a short read, uh, basically you, you map the short read against the reference genome. And this gives you information about the, the, the presence absence of the DNA, okay? So when you have a lot of zero coverage region, that is probably due to a deletion. And when we looked at uh, the, the size of, the, of this outlier chromosome, we noted that uh, strains that tended to, to be resistant to many viruses we had in the lab tend to have a larger uh, outlier chromosome. And this made us very curious about the, the sequence of this outlier chromosome in, in natural population. And this we can only sort out with long read because of the um, highly repetitive nature of this chromosome. And, um, and we observed something very interesting. It's uh, that uh, this chromosome, so here you have six individuals uh, that have six different uh, outlier chromosomes from 400 to 600 uh, uh, kilobase in length. And um, uh, it's the, this chromosome is hypervariable. Um, you've got few syntonic regions in, in, in blue. Other, otherwise, you've got a lot of rearranged DNA. So this is what I colored in yellow here. And then you have approximately one third of, uh, of the DNA that is actually just in one uh, chromosome and not in the others. So we just did a sequence similarity uh, search of this um, um, strain-specific DNA. And uh, at that time, so maybe we would need to, to redo that, we didn't find a lot of information. There was not a lot of, of data, of, of meaningful data in the databases about where this uh, DNA could, uh, could come from. 
Uh, then we had a lot of um, DNA that actually comes from uh, the, the microalgae, but from other chromosomes. Okay, so meaning that this, this DNA has been translocated from other chromosomes into that outlier chromosome. And in one case, we had a tiny uh, 50 nucleotide long casinovirus uh, sequence, but just in one strain. So um, this made us very, very curious about uh, how uh, cell immunity to viruses uh, work in, in our system. So the take home message of this first part is that, uh, well, we do have a, a, a variable immunity to presinoviruses in natural populations of osteococcus, that uh, one chromosome size increases with antivirus resistance and that this chromosome is hypervariable and that this level of hypervariability can only be generated by massive rearrangements, duplications, deletions, translocations. So now it brings me to my to the second part of my talk about uh, the, the evolution of uh, resistance and susceptibility. So basically, when you infect a, a microalgae with a virus, if you wait, uh, if you are patient enough to wait for several days, uh, you will always uh, actually have some cells that will survive and uh, either become resistant or resistant producers. So the two differences is whether they continue to produce viruses or not in the culture. So we've got uh, we've got the, the Mosa line that actually uh, because we always start our culture from one single cell, so we try to reduce the level of variability in our cultures. Uh, this Mosa line will uh, generate daughters that will become resistant somehow. So let's look into one of these cases. So uh, this is. Uh, another Osteocophus mediterraneus uh, species we were interested in for evolutionary regions, uh, evolutionary reasons, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, branching at the base of the Osteococcus lineage. So we looked into its genome and uh, when we uh, obtained the genome assembly, we, uh, we observed that there was a complete uh, presence of viruses uh, in our genome data sets. And surprise, when we got back into the culture of this strain, actually the, the virus was still being produced. And what you can see on this graph is that um, depending on how you measure the virus, by cytometry, it's the empty triangles and the uh, full triangles, they are uh, the, the by plaque forming unit that gives you an estimation of the number of infected viruses. You do have actually a two orders of magnitude of difference in the estimation of these virus particles. We didn't uh, dig into that. What we took home from this is that the, the virus was still being produced uh, in this population and it, it was linearly increasing. Well, it was increasing together with the microalgae. Uh, so this was a stable, uh, a, what we call a stable um, a coexistence. Uh, this is just a picture of the genome of the virus to convince you that it's a proper virus. And so we were um, thinking about uh, how 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 is this uh, how does this working? How are these, these these cells producing the virus? So we looked at it at uh, using uh, electron uh, microscopy, and basically 99.5% of the cells that they are they look fine, there's no virus in the cells, in the cytoplasma, they look uh, fine, but a few proportion of them uh, seem to be infected. So we imagined, we imagined basically that uh, there, was a, 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 there are two states for the same cell corresponding to these two phenotypes, that actually there was a, a switch in, in, in this phenotype uh, happening in the culture. So we collaborated with theoricians who uh, came up with uh, parameters and equations, and basically they predicted the equilibrium varies to microalgae um, proportion as a function of these parameters. 
And what is really in interesting as a parameter is this rate of switch between the two phenotypes. Because this we can try to assess experimentally and see if, if it makes sense. And then the second thing we're interested in is basically the molecular mechanism generating this switch between phenotypes. Uh, okay, so basically what we think might happen in our cultures is that the, the, the cells, they do switch phenotypes at a certain rate. Uh, the susceptible strains, they uh, divide a little bit more rapid rapidly than the resistant one, and so they are prevalent when there's no virus. When the virus arrives, all susceptible cells are lysed, and basically the, produce, the production of um, viruses is a consequence of the switch from resistance to susceptibility over time. So let's look now into the, 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 the mechanism involved in this uh, susceptible, well, first resistant to susceptible switch. So if you take a resistant culture that has no virus, meaning that when you add a virus, you do not increase the number of viruses. So that is what we call a resistant cell. You can actually isolate and single cells and then you will grow these cells and then you will expose them again to the virus. So we did that more than 200 times. And basically what you will observe is that in for this strain, in this condition, at this temperature, in this media, we had 20% uh, of, uh, of, of susceptible strains, meaning that we observed this switch between resistant and susceptible cells. So we looked at the... Um, the genomes of these resistant and susceptible cells. And at that time, uh, we did pulsed field gel electrophoresis. Um, the genome is so small in our eukaryotes that you can actually migrate it on a gel. And then you can actually see the chromosomes. And then you can use uh, a probes to check where uh, this or this chromosome here. So what you can see uh, on, on this slide is that actually it's actually the small outlier chromosome that changed in size between resistant and susceptible cells. And so we decided to sequence uh, this resistant and this susceptible uh, cell using a length, again, long read because you, you can't resolve this outlier chromosome with short read. And so we characterize a 60 kilobase deletion on the SOC that is associated to the loss of resistance. Because the SOC is full of repeats, it's not because you delete 60 uh, kilobases that you delete all the genes. Basically, the only uh, genes that are uh, just in this region are the, the six genes, the seven genes that are here. So these are the uh, putative uh, genes that are involved in the resistant phenotype. Uh, two hypothetical proteins, one transposon I do not think is involved in, um, in, in the loss of resistance, and then uh, two, uh, two enzymes that actually change, uh, may change uh, uh, sugars. Okay, so it's not very clear how this uh, resistant to susceptible switch uh, is organized. So the, the conclusion of this uh, resistant to susceptible uh, switch is still very incomplete, but we are uh, working on it. So uh, we do know how to uh, isolate uh, a susceptible strain from resistant uh, lines by single cell, uh, actually uh, single cell uh, um, isolation. Uh, we do have just the genomic signatures for now, so it's a deletion of, of part of the SOC chromosome, but we plan to do transcriptomics, metabolomics, and translatomics in uh, 2025. So this was the, 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 the resistant to susceptible switch. And now I'm going to uh, uh, go into the, the reverse switch from susceptible to resistance, where we have... Uh, uh, much more data because we were uh, somehow more interested in the evolution of resistance than the reverse. So basically, you take susceptible strains, you infect them with viruses, 
Uh, so you need um, a lot of viruses. You need to amplify from, from your strain. And then you are gonna infect uh, some, some, some of these cultures. You put in different flasks and you will observe the lysis with these viruses. And uh, um, you, you, you have a control experiment, of course, so where, where you don't add viruses. And then the first thing we did is what to do a comparative transcriptomics between the susceptible lines and the resistant lines that had evolved from the uh, susceptible lines. And what we found here was uh, uh, well, different, differently expressed genes. Uh, and many of these genes, they were located on the outlier chromosome. Uh, and the expression on the outlier chromosome was actually clustered. Uh, there are some regions that were on and some regions that were off. Uh, the function of these uh, upregulated and downregulated uh, down genes uh, they are of, of different types, but many of these genes are actually unknown. So the hypothesis we have, it's again, it turns around the role of glycotransferases that may change uh, the, uh, the sugars on, on membrane proteins or methyltransferase that may, uh, may be involved maybe in epigenomic modification, changing the transcription of um, um, of the of the genome of the microalgae. So um, then we wanted to uh, look into the genomic signatures uh, because we realized that this uh, chromosome was actually hyper variable and and um, that we we needed to characterize this hyper variability. So we did the same kind of experiment again. We're uh, going from um, a susceptible strain. We evolved uh, resistance, and then we uh, sequenced the genome with nanopore. So at that time, long weed sequencing was still a little bit expensive. So we couldn't do it for 40 uh, independent strains. We just did it for five. So actually, the mother line uh, has its uh, the coverage of its uh, sub chromosome uh, represented uh, here. So it's a 600 kilo base sub chromosome. The black uh, color represents a deletion as compared to the reference genome. So this is the the the, the reference genome is a resistant strain. So mother line is uh, one of the susceptible descendants of this um, mother line that has lost a part of this uh, sock. This is what you can see here. So then uh, uh, the daughters of this mother line, they evolved independently five times resistance. And this is uh, the coverage of the outlier chromosomes we obtain. So, on this particular couple, you can see differences between the resistant and the susceptible train with a very well more copies of this part of the chromosome is a resistant strain. However, it seems to be an exception in all the other uh, uh, evolutions of resistance. The um, coverage of the outlier chromosome seems to be very similar. However, what we noted with this experiment is that uh, the, the outlier chromosome is very variable within our population, independently of the evolution of resistance. And so this led us to con conclude that the, 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 the changes in size of the SOC are actually not uh, linked to the acquisition of resistance or uh, the virus infection, it's a spontaneous phenomenon in our culture. So this is just a coverage analysis, so it's not very precise. We are looking into the long read assemblies to get, to get the telomere to telomere chromosomes uh, to characterize exactly the nature of the um, outlier chromosomes in, uh, um, in, in this data set. Okay, and um, then we also wanted to um, to look at the, 
the metabolomic signatures, uh, the initial idea was that this would help us to understand uh, the function of the unknown genes we have in the genome in general, those that are differently expressed between resistant and susceptible lines, and all these genes on the outer chromosome, we have no idea of their function. So we did um, uh, a monitoring of the metabolome and the transcriptome over uh, the life of Australococcus. It's 24 uh, day, 24 hours, sorry. And as a photosynthetic organism, you can imagine the transcriptome uh, is very different between the light and the, and the night. So we took four transcriptomes, uh, four transcriptomes and two metabolomes. So the metabolomic analysis was performed by chemists. And uh, this is what they found. So they extracted, uh, depending on their mass and on their charge, the uh, compounds in the susceptible and in the resistant cells. And uh, since I annotated these compounds, and uh, for genomission, it was uh, interesting to see that they also have a lot of unknown annotations as we have for genomes. So compounds, they have the mass, they have the charge, they have the spectra, but actually they have no idea of the structure of these compounds. However, what you can see from the analysis is that um, you have actually much more compounds that are overabundant in susceptible as compared to resistant cells. And then I give you two examples of uh, susceptible uh, biomarkers that are lipids. So there are the two molecules uh, uh, on the top. And this ceramide is one of the um, uh, metabolites that is more prevalent in the resistance in the resistant cells. And what you can also see here is that there's no marker of resistance uh, in the night. What about the transcriptomic signatures? So this is a classical differential gene expression analysis uh, uh, along uh, the, the four time points. So we've got in total seven more than, well, 800 differently expressed genes that are either overexpressed in the susceptible or resistant cells. And so, of course, we wanted to integrate these two kinds of information to, to understand uh, the resistant and susceptible phenotypes. So when we uh, tried the top-bottom approach, looking at the differently expressed uh, gene in our data set, they were not at all involved in uh, the production of uh, these metabolites, no link. So we tried the bottom-up approach. We looked at the genes that are involved in the synthesis of these metabolites. And then we went back to the transcriptomic data to check whether the genes that are involved and, and then indeed it's, it's a chain of gene that is involved in the production of this metabolite, whether uh, its transcription is changed between susceptible and resistant strain. And then we found uh, a signal. So uh, we, we can define congruence between the gene expression and a metabolite when the abundance of a metabolite uh, is uh, related to gene expression variation. And for these three metabolites uh, on, the, on the left, on the right, sorry, of my slides, there's a clear congruence of the gene expression of the different genes that are involved in the production of this metabolite and the biomarker metabolite. So this is uh, quite reassuring. Uh, however, uh, indeed, when you look at the differently expressed genes, you wouldn't find these genes. So this means that there's a decoupling in the signal between the transcription change that appear and the metabolomic change we can detect. An interesting result we got is that some of the metabolomic results enabled us to annotate some genes uh, uh, in our uh, genome, but not a lot. Okay, so this uh, brings me to the last uh, layer of information we have. We are going to deploy to uh, try to understand the resistant and susceptible phenotype. Uh, this is what I call translatomics. So um, it's a translation, actually, of uh, 
of messenger RNA. So uh, we are interested in the duplication and rearrangement rate in our organism. And basically, when you look at the DNA copy number, for example, of a chromosome or large chromosome, chromosomal region, and you es estimate the transcription of the gene on this chromosome, uh, the transcription generally scales with the DNA copy number. Okay, so this is true in our picoalgae, it is true in most eukaryotes. So this is not a big surprise. This raises the question, how does the cell cope with this imbalance of transcripts following a duplication? To assess this, uh, we did, we, we extracted uh, the RNAs that are bounded to the ribosomes, the polysomes. So to do that, you ultra centrifuge your RNA, your RNA data, and the RNA bounded to uh, the, the ribosomes, they are heavier. And then you can sequence this fraction. And by comparing the RNA that are bounded to the ribosomes, whereas the total RNA, you can uh, estimate how many of the messenger RNA are translated, okay, are actually transformed into proteins. And what we could see here very clearly is that there is uh, the, the translation rate of the genes on duplicated chromosome 4, they are nearly half translated as compared to the genes that are on single copy chromosomes, meaning that you have dosage compensation of protein synthesis at the level of translation. Somehow the cells sense there's too much messenger RNA and they fix less ribosomes onto it. And this motivated us to uh, also check uh, translation rates, especially uh, as we are interested in large-scale duplications uh, in the phenotypic change. Because the, this um, translatomic data will provide a more precise estimation of protein uh, abundance as compared as transcription rates. Okay, so uh, what is the take home message of all this? So we do have uh, acquired, we have acquired independently uh, different signatures of the uh, susceptible to resistance um, switch at the transcriptomic level, so uh, targeting genes on the small outlier chromosome that are highly influenced by this change in phenotype. On the genomic level, uh, we understood that basically uh, some of these transcriptional changes are as a, the simple consequence of large structural rearrangement of the SOC, like deletions and duplication. The metabolomic uh, protocols we developed, uh, they enabled us to uh, see that the resistant cells uh, ha actually have less biomarkers, especially lipids and susceptible cell, uh, meaning that maybe resistant is just um, being more simple uh, on, on the outside membrane. Less is more for resistance to viruses. And as for the translatomics approach, uh, we think it's important to do that, uh, to, to get a more accurate estimation of, of protein abundance in these cells. So all these results, they were obtained on different experiments uh, because uh, this is research. You never get the money to do everything at once. And you also learn as you progress. So the transcript for to do transcriptomics, we had 40, um, 40 lines and you need it in triplicates. Then when we did genomics, it was very expensive. So we could just do it uh, for five uh, events. Uh, metabolomics is extremely expensive in biomass. The chemists, they want huge amounts of culture. They want five replicates. So we just did it for one, uh, susceptible to resistant uh, uh, change. And, uh, and so we compiled all these preliminary results to get funding to do it all at once, to make uh, 
all these different level of information to get them from the same experimental evolution. So basically, this is uh, the, the project. So it's 13 days of experiment. You infect your cultures with a virus. You will observe lysis and sand resistant. And again, this cycle, you will perform transcriptomics, genomics, metabolomics, and translatomics. You will also do uh, electron microscopy. You will try to, to fix uh, the samples to observe the dynamic of the infected cells uh, across time. Uh, this requires a lot of biomass, much more than we are used to do. So we had to uh, change the way we culture our uh, culture. So here you can see the experiment we started just before the Christmas holiday. So you can see, you can see the lysis strains or not. We tried bubbles, we tried uh, uh, without bubbles. And uh, to our surprise, um, uh, basically the resistance, instead of evolving uh, after three days, evolved after 10 days and the whole experiment instead of um, of being made in, in, in 15 days uh, lasted uh, one month. Uh, we don't know exactly uh, why it is. It could be because of the temperature, uh, because we, we did it at 15 degrees and all our previous experiments we did at 20 degrees. So it's an unexpected, interesting uh, effect of temperature and the evolution of resistance in our system. So now uh, we are doing the experiment again at 20 degrees. Uh, it's still in progress. Uh, we hope it's going to be less long than the previous one. And this is actually the pilot experiment we need to do to organize a big experiment. Because to do the experiment, you need six trained people uh, to, to do all the, the protocols uh, at once. So that's it. Uh, I need to thank. Uh, all uh, my colleagues uh, from Banyuls uh, in uh, in bold, all the the colleagues who are actually doing this uh, crazy experiment, uh, and send our collaborators uh, on uh, molecular biology and uh, theoretical biology from the University of Perpignan, uh, uh, Didier Stien, who's the chemist uh, on board and also our uh, colleagues from the cytometry platform who are uh, helping us a lot on following uh, these uh, biological systems. And I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'm welcoming your question. Thank you, Gwenaëlle. I'm going to clap my hand for everybody. <laughs> thank you very much. You should pre-record it, it's nice to... <laughs> Uh, actually, people can raise their hand, but I think they will do it to require the microphone. Uh, they can also ask questions. So Stephanie has a question already. So Stephanie, you are a panelist, so you can talk whenever you want. Um, thank you for your talk. So uh, one uh, quite uh, interesting feature is this uh, instability or this... Um, liability of, of the SOC chromosome. Is it only this chromosome or is it a more feature of the whole genome of the of the algae? And then um, is it linked to these uh, highly repeated regions that can uh, be used as a recombination point? And so that's why you have so many uh, rearrangements in this chromosome. So uh, yes, we, we checked covered And we hope but so when see a, a higher rate of rearrangement of this, um rearrangement duplications, um uh, repetitive uh, regions are magnets for these kinds of events. Um, so yes, I think the fact that there is a high amount of rep repetitive English, it's it stimulates uh uh, these events, these recombination events. Okay, Aline has a question. I open your microphone, Aline, so you okay, can ask it you. directly. 
Uh, hi, Gwenael, very interesting talk, thank you. And uh, I was wondering about the dosage compensation you characterized uh, towards the end of the talk. Do you have any idea how it's regulated uh, at the translation stage? Yeah, that's a, a very uh, intriguing finding we have. So it seems that uh, there's a chromosome-wide uh, regulation of translation. So this, we know how it works in bacteria. In eukaryotes, it's quite surprising because the transcription, uh, you know, the translation is, is not at the same place as the transcription. Uh, we don't know. Uh, I can't imagine that, um, I, I can't, the, this is a messaging RNA that are in excess, they must be tagged. Uh, we think that they are tagged with uh, smaller uh, poly A links. So how does the cell uh, sense this excess of uh, messaging RNA? Uh, to tag them and to reduce a translation, uh, I don't know, but uh, I am very interested in this uh, question. Actually, there are people working on, on Drosophila who did uh, observe some uh, translational regulation in uh, sexual chromosomes in Drosophila some time ago, but there was no other, uh, uh, well, I haven't seen any other, uh, well, it's not true, there was another publication about it, but it well it exists in Drosophila, I, I can tell you, but indeed we 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 don't know how it um, how it uh, how how the cells sense this and how the cells deal with it. And I think it's a very interesting fundamental cell biology question. Thank you. Okay, we have another question by Yanis Mikalakis. Yanis, you can talk if you want. Uh, we cannot hear you, Yanis. I don't know why, because your microphone is open. I don't know what happens, but Yanis, uh, what uh, if question? Ah, okay. Sorry, my, my speaker stopped functioning. So, um, so uh, hello, Gunel. So my question was that um, I have the impression that the observational uh, data suggests a correlation between genome size and resistance, while the experimental evolution data suggests an absence of this correlation. So I was wondering whether this impression is correct, and if indeed it is correct, whether there is a, a way to reconcile the two. Yeah, so I do agree with you. Uh, so what I showed is that what we what we first observed is that when a strain is um, is not infected by a lot of virus, uh, it tends to have a longer chromosome. And what we're doing in the lab is that we are uh, evolving resistance from susceptible strains. Okay, so so not too many viruses. So it's not necessarily contradictory if you imagine that resistance to each virus necessitates a little bit more information. That's not exactly what we're doing in the lab. We're just evolving resistance to one uh, strain. Um, I do doubt, well, I, I do agree with you that I, I, am, I am not sure this relationship will hold uh, with, with a larger data set, but it could if if uh, resistance to each virus, you know, needs some needs some extra extra something, uh, and so to be resistant to many many viruses somehow it it helps to have a, a, a larger diversity on this outlier chromosome. But I'm indeed I'm not sure this result will hold as uh, our data set increases. I hope it was this qu your question. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we have another question by Sylvain Gandon. Sylvain, you can talk. Yes, hello. Uh, so I had a question about the virus so, uh, and about... Um, so here you talk mostly about one type of resistance, but I was wondering whether actually there was some viability in the resistance that you can select for and if the virus can... Uh, if you have evidence that the virus can evolve to different types of resistance so that there would be room for coevolution later on, do you have some evidence for that? 
So actually, you have uh, David uh, de Mouri and Sherry Yo who, who are trying to uh, investigate this at the moment with a master uh, student. Uh, so um, I don't have uh, any results to to tell you, but indeed, uh, uh, it's it's a very interesting uh, uh, a, a very interesting interesting uh, thing to look at the evolution of the virus over time. Okay, thanks. Okay, another question by Ignacio Bravo. You can open your mic and ask your question. We cannot hear you, Ignacio. I don't know why your microphone is open. You hear me now? Yes. Good. I think so. Uh, hi, Gunnel. It's a pity we can wake up so you're not here. I have um because I would have many questions if I could. So I will have only one. <laughs> like only 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 one and a half. So is so yeah. Coming back to the to the gene dosage, which is ex extremely interesting. So what you have shown is that there is a correlation between the between well, so DNA and amount of RNA, and the, but the the, the my point is um. Is this true for all genes encoded in the chromosome? Because there are like around, um, uh, there are probably hundreds of genes in each chromosome. So this um, differential dosage is true for all genes in the chromosome. No, and no, then no. if so, could it also be as it has been also, see, I only know about human cells. Can this, can this be that the RNA is not properly exported from the nucleus as it happens in 80 rich uh, genes or that it is retained in P bodies so that you can have the mRNA there, but it's not available for translation. So we, it will never be enriched in, the, in your polysomes. Um, so the question is how, um, so how common, how global is this trend for all genes in a chromosome and whether the subcellular location may be the key for being uh, present in polysomes or not? Okay, so thank you for your first question. Indeed, you have, as in trisomy and et cetera, uh, you do have uh, genes that are invariant. You double the DNA copy. You do not increase the number of RNA because there's a specific regulation of the um, trans the there are do the dosage invariant genes. So we do have these genes, okay? But they're, they're minoritary. They're minoritaire. And so when you look at the average transcription, uh, because that's what we did. We represented the result per chromosome or per chromosomic region. You do expect a double fold, but we did also in the paper detail the dosage invariant genes that do exist for, you know, multimeric domain that have their special transcription factors. So they, they have their own regulation. So this is the answer to the first question. Then, um, um, I don't know if there are pea bodies uh, in, in Osteococcus. Uh, actually, they are very small cells, so it's very difficult to uh, look at imaging within the cell. We're just trying to start to do that, to locate the RNA of the virus inside the cell during fluorescent uh, protein. So I don't know I, I don't know how to, to do that, but uh, yeah, indeed, these, yeah, these, these RNAs, they could also be um, physically close somehow and um and regulated that way um it would be nice to discuss that uh, with you um I, I don't know what's going on great no no thanks a lot and then if i uh, so nicola may i have the, the, the yeah. time for one question yeah so then the question is that coming to your metabolomics which i find fascinating right is that so one of the things you said is so you have spoken essentially or mostly of of uh, signatures that that had to do with some lipids or modified lipids or with the chlor with the chlorophylls or pigments and then but one of the of the signatures in the in your differentially expressed genes were glycosyl transferases so which which makes sense for the interaction between virus and host so do you have any metabolomic signature for differentially expressed sugars and or gly so any glycid that could be could it could could explain this differential sensitivity we we don't have that yet 
uh, we don't have that. Uh, we have um, some amine differences, but not sugar differences. And uh, the chemist, uh, Didier Sien, told me that um, the extraction method he used may, may not see these kind of glucose changes. So we would need to, when you do metabolomics, you never get the complete uh, metabolites. You always get a fraction depending on how you extracted the the compo the the thing so i think we we may need to diversify the the extraction method of, of the metabolites to to get uh, sugar information but indeed we um we, we are just at the beginning of the metabolomic uh, uh, characterization thank you very mm -hmm. much silva has another question it is yeah, just a quick one. It's about, again, the virus. I was wondering whether you, because you showed some variation during, I mean, between the night and the day, I was wondering about the life cycle of the virus. Does, do you have any evidence of the similar um, sensitivity to the to light and the daylight uh, for the life cycle of the virus? Uh, um, so what we did, we, we looked at the virus decay um and we are interested in in keeping our viruses so we know that the decay of our viruses in the fridge in the dark at four degrees is, is very very high uh so we we don't try to kill our viruses because we work so hard to 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 produce them so uh to do the experiments so i i don't well if you heat them you will kill them I, I don't know. We didn't um, look into uh, destroying our viruses. Uh, what we know, however, is that temperature seems to have a massive, uh, a massive, uh, and this has been uh, published by uh, David de uh, uh, before. If you change the temperature, you will change uh, a lot of things about the the, the virulence. Whether and even you may change the, you may make a strain resistant to a virus if you change the temperature. And what I meant is that um, maybe during the daylight, the, the cells are actually, I mean, because they are uh, photo photosynthetic, they are changing their uh, physiology and maybe this could affect the, the, the growth of the virus. And if some resistant cell try to shut off, uh, shut down the, the photosynthesis, maybe the, the virus could react to that. And maybe that would be a, a way to resist. I, I thought that was kind of what some of the results you showed were pointing to, but I was wondering whether that was the case. Okay, now you don't have a shutdown of photosynthesis uh, in the resistant cells. Okay, so they are still. And actually, what happens is that the, the, the virus will go into the cell and uh, the lysis uh, occurs at night. Okay. So the viruses is maintaining the foot when it infects cell is maintaining the, the energy storage and the photosynthetic uh, thing. And it's only once once uh, at the during the night that it will uh, finish uh, its job and, and lyse the cell. But uh, we, yeah, we we may um, we may imagine that resistant cells are somehow um, shutting down um, at least um, the, what goes on on their external membrane, but they do not sound photo photosynthesis. Okay, thanks. Okay, I don't see any more questions. So maybe Stephanie, you can have the last word to thank Gwenaël. Uh, okay, well, thanks a lot, Gwenaël, for not for coming. <laughs> it was not possible. <laughs> but um, yeah, um, yeah, thanks a lot for your presentation. And uh, we'll try to organize something for, for you to come uh, soon. <laughs> Okay, right. thank you very much. Well, These very nice uh, questions, and uh, indeed, I'm looking forward to uh, uh, to coming to Montpellier in person this year. Okay, thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.